Okay, today I'm going to talk about the birth of the universe or the beginning of time. And I'm just going to focus in on talking or discussing what the Big Bang Theory is and the evidence for uh, the Big Bang. So the Big Bang Theory is a basically this theory that there was this titanic or huge explosion that created energy, matter, space, and time. And it occurred about 13 to 15 billion years ago. And it does play out on this, this time scale. Uh, and you can kind of see that this time scale is very, very small. Like from here to here is just one second. And then we have three minutes and then 300,000 years to a billion years to 15 billion years. And this picture that I started with, um, this is, oh God, the radiation, the leftover radiation from the Big Bang Theory, if you will. So this is, I think it's called the cosmic microwave background. So after the Big Bang, there was this release of cosmic microwave background and universe was dark until the birth of stars and galaxies formed. And yeah, I mean, it took, it took a while for that to happen. So on this diagram here, it says the cosmos goes through a super fast inflation expanded from the size of an atom to that of a grapefruit in a tiny fraction of a second. Step two, post-inflation, the universe is a seething hot soup of electrons, quarks, and other particles. Step three, a rapidly cooling cosmos permits quarks to clump into protons and neutrons. Step four, still too hot to form into atoms, charged electrons, and protons prevent light from shining. The universe is a super hot fog. Step five, the electrons combine with protons and neutrons to, for, to form atoms, mostly hydrogen and helium. Light can finally shine. Step six, kind of the galaxy era. Gravity makes hydrogen and helium gas coalesce to form the giant clouds that will become galaxies. Smaller clumps of clouds collapse to form the first stars. And then as galaxies cluster together under gravity, the first stars die and spew heavy elements into space. These will eventually form into new stars and planets. So what were the conditions like in the early universe? Well, the early universe had to have been extremely hot and dense. Because the universe, you know, as it cooled, it expanded. And by using the laws of physics and the current temperature of the universe, which is about 3 Kelvin, we can calculate just how hot the universe had to have been in the past. And so this graph shows the results. And just notice that everything is based on the power powers of 10. Okay. Okay. So then our universe is hot during the first few seconds. Um, photons can transform themselves into matter and vice versa because of Einstein's formula. Remember, E equals mc squared. And reactions create and destroy matter that are very rare in the universe at large, but um, we can re reproduce many of these reactions in laboratories. Um, another reaction that occurs is the creation or, or destruction of electron or anti-electron pair. So this is what I'm going to talk about here, anti-electron pairs. So when two photons, light, okay, particles collide with a total energy greater than twice the mass energy of an electron, they can create two brand new particles. In this case, a negatively charged electron, which you are all familiar with, and you can kind of see that up here, and then um, a positively charged twin, the anti-electron. Now, you probably didn't know there was an anti-electron, but it's also known as a positron. So maybe you've heard of positrons. Um, the electron is a particle of matter, and the anti-electron is a particle of antimatter. And so this reaction that occurs creates an electron-anti-electron pair that also runs in reverse. So when electron and anti-electron meet, they annihilate each other totally, transforming all their mass energy back into a photon energy. So in order to conserve both energy and momentum, an annihilation reaction must produce two photons instead of one. So you can kind of see that down here. Now, there are four known forces in the universe, okay? Um, gravity, of these four, gravity is probably the most familiar because that provides the glue that holds stars, planets, galaxies together. Uh, the electromagnetic force, or electromagnetism, depends on electrical charge of a particle instead of its mass, and it's far stronger than gravity, okay? Um, it is therefore probably the dominant force between particles and atoms and electrons and responsible for a lot of chemical and biological uh, reactions so yeah okay the last two the strong and the weak force so strong and weak forces operate over very very short distances basically atomic nuclei 
but not much larger than that. The strong force binds atomic nuclei together. The weak force plays a role in nuclear reactions such as fission and fusion, and it's the only force besides gravity that affects weakly interacting particles such as neutrinos. Okay, hold on, sorry. Lucas says fidget in again. Yeah, buddy. I don't know what's going on. Okay, moving on. Okay, so these four forces um, at extremely high temperatures. So the four forces are distinct at low temperatures, but they can merge at very high temperatures, such as those that occurred just in the first fraction of a second after the Big Bang. Okay. Um, oh my goodness. Okay, so anyways. Um, excuse you. Experiments that have shown the electromagnetic and weak forces lose their separate identities under condi conditions of very high temperature energy, and they can merge together into a single electroweak force. So yes, they unify at high temperatures. Now, the gut force. Gut stands for the grand unified theories. So theories that predict the merger of the electroweak and strong forces are called guts, for short. So the merger of strong, weak, and electromagnetic forces is therefore often called gut force, and we do suspect that even at higher energies, the gut force and gravity merge into maybe a single super force that governs the behavior of everything. And this is where you may have heard of these theories like supersymmetry or super string theory or maybe super gravity theory. So who knows um, for the super force. Now, how did the early universe change with time? So we divide kind of this big bang theory into several different like eras, if you will, to kind of make sense of the universe's early history. And they're kind of distinguished from the next by some major change in the physical conditions as the universe is cooling. Uh, so I'm just gonna talk about these each in step here. First off, talking about Planck era. Now we don't have a theory to describe conditions in the Planck era and you know, you can see a lot of question marks at the top there. Um, yeah, so we really don't have any idea as to what may have happened in the Planck era. Um, if I remember right, it might have just been a single force that kind of operated in nature, maybe a super force or something. Moving on to the gut era. So the gut era is when two forces operated in the universe, in this case gravity. Uh, in the gut force, so it's unified here. Ooh, excuse you. Um, so yeah, two forces are thought to have operated during this time. So, gut era. Now we have our electroweak era. So elementary particles appear spontaneously from energy, but also transform rapidly back into energy. Um, so then we get our particle area where we start to get our elementary particles like quarks and protons and antiprotons. Um, so amounts of matter and antimatter are nearly equal at this stage. We also get the area of nucleosynthesis. So fusion produced helium for protons from hydrogen nuclei and the protons were annihilated virtually oh, annihilated virtually all antiprotons but some protons remained. The era of the nuclei is the helium nuclei form at around three minutes after the birth of the universe. Era of atoms. So now we're starting to form atoms. Background radiation is released. This happened about uh, 380,000 years, you know, into the, the birth of the universe. And then finally our era of galaxies. Okay, so basically, Early universe was hot and dense. As it cooled, we got particle production. Fusion turned remaining neutrons into helium. And then we have radiation um, that's traveling freely after the formation of these atoms. Okay, evidence for the Big Bang. There's two big key evidence, if you will. Uh, number one, the detection of the leftover radiation from the Big Bang. And I'm going to talk more about that here. And then number two, the Big Bang Theory that uh, predicts the abundance of helium and other light elements. So <clears throat> the cosmic microwave background, basically the picture I started this lecture with, is the radiation left over, and it was detected by two men 
um, that worked at Bell Laboratories in New Jersey. And they were calibrating a very sensitive microwave antenna for satellite communications. And they kept getting this unexpected noise in every measurement that they made with um, the, their antenna. And you guys might have remembered these guys. We watched a video earlier this semester. These were the guys that went out onto their antenna and scraped off pigeon poop because they thought maybe they were detecting this background noise caused by pigeon droppings or pigeon poop. Um, but what they were actually picking up was the cosmic microwave background or the radiation left over from the Big Bang. It doesn't take a very powerful telescope to see this radiation. You can pick it up on a television antenna. So if we, this, this is not cable or satellite TV. This is an old fashioned antenna fit television where you go to a, a channel where there's no, where there isn't a local station and you see a screen full of static or snow and 1% of the static that you're seeing is due to photons in this cosmic microwave background. So even though Maybe you're watching this. I don't know. Your friends are like, why, why are you watching this? You can tell them you're actually watching the most incredible site ever, right? The Big Bang, or at least as close as we'll ever get to it, right? Okay. <clears throat> now, this graph is showing the spectrum of the cosmic microwave background recorded by NASA's COBE satellite. COBE stands for Cosmic Background Explorer, and it was launched in the early 1990s. Um, to test ideas about the cosmic microwave background. So it has um, theoretically calculated thermal radiation spectrum, which is a nice smooth curve for the temperature of 2.73 Kelvin for basically the start of um, the Big Bang. Okay, the second piece of evidence, I talked about the abundance of elements, mostly this portion of hydrogen to helium. So protons and neutrons combine to make helium nuclei when the universe was just three minutes old. And our Big Bang Theory predicts that um, when you look at something, most of it's hydrogen and then 25% of it's around helium. And this prediction matches observations of primordial gases. Um, I read an interesting, I wrote down an interesting statistic about this. Okay, so it says, um, everywhere in the universe, about one quarter of the mass of ordinary matter is helium. The Milky Way's helium fraction is about 28%, and no galaxy has a helium fraction lower than 25%. A small proportion of this helium comes from hydrogen fusion in stars, but most does not. Fusion of hydrogen to helium in stars could have produced only about 10% of the observed helium. The majority of the helium in the universe must already have been present in the protogalactic clouds that preceded the formation of galaxies. In other words, the universe itself must once have been hot enough to fuse hydrogen into helium. The current microwave background temperature of 2.73 Kelvin tells us precisely how hot the universe was in the distance past and exactly how much helium it should have made. The result, 25% helium, is another impressive success of the Big Bang Theory. So, kind of cool. So that does it for the birth of the universe. And I think we are zooming tomorrow. So I will see you guys tomorrow.